So I myself, I'm a distributed systems engineer at Mesosphere. That means I'm mostly working like Mesos, but I also I travel quite a lot. I, for example, was at Spark Summit and actually try to keep uh, connection to the community, talking exactly about those topics like what kind of applications do we want to run, what kind of architectures do we want to run on top of Mesos. Uh, so, in the beginning it was all pretty simple. We basically we had batch going on and uh, the do method used, it was crunching all our data. It was quite simple. We had this one single uh, distributed application, the do running in our clusters, but actually uh, we need to turn faster. So uh, today, actually, Hadoop and batch processing isn't enough anymore. For example, like considering YouTube is streaming or uh, uploading 300 hours of videos like every minute. Uh, every minute, Google has like over 3 million search queries, probably like Bing and the Chinese services as well. Uh, Twitter has like around 400 to 500 thousand uh, tweets. So this is like way too much that you would aggregate all of this and then run a big batch job of, on top of it end of day. So uh, it's just like too much and too fast data uh, to do that. Uh, also like, uh, for example, like the IoT use cases where we have a lot of sensors, as for example, like the new Airbus, uh, it's actually, it has over 10,000, around between 12 and 15, or like estimates, uh, thousand sensors on each wing. And so like on each flight, uh, it's producing like seven terabytes of data which need to be processed or streamed. Uh, other use cases are like, for example, like in uh, traffic control where you also have a lot of sensors. So basically, uh, the world we are living in, there are more and more sensors and we're collecting more and more data which need to be processed. Like all those data, for example, from the traffic, uh, where I try to adjust like real time I uh, try to control uh, all the uh, all the lights going on and basically try to control where the traffic is flowing. It doesn't help me if I end of the day run my batch job, but I actually want to use it in real time and rather fast. And that's what we're talking about, fast data here. And what we're seeing, therefore, on modern clusters is actually we're having several kinds of application or uh, analytics running. Like, there's still like use cases for batch processing where I collect all my data and end of the day uh, or end of the month, I run like a big Hadoop job across all my data. But it's more moving towards like micro batches. As for example, Flink is doing uh, where I run like batches like with really small size, like in the megabytes, one or two megabyte range. And so I can basically get results within seconds and not within hours. Uh, once after starting the batch job. And for like even faster, when I need faster feedback, uh, I'm really moving into this event processing field, as for example like Flink is doing, uh, where we get results like in under a second, within microseconds. So that helps me to, for example, if I really, uh, if I click in, for example, in like some store and I really need, within computing, uh, the answer and delivering like the answer to me, it's going to get like the best recommendations for me. I cannot wait for a second there because otherwise the user experience would just be bad. Um, and for all of those uh, areas, for all of those timings, there are actually different applications I can run. And that's what's making this entire field kind of like difficult because I always have to decide uh, what I want to use and which timing, like which response times do I need. So the usual flow in this universe uh, of fast data or IoT, it's actually we're having like some sensors or sources as in the plane example, we might collect data from uh, the wings, from like all the engines, they have a lot of sensors. So this is usually like the input while it's getting into my system. Then usually we're having some storage component as we also want to either store like the sensors directly all we want to store like the processed outputs. So uh, I need something of where I have persistent storage where I can actually uh, get my results or get my input into the query again. And yeah, then probably most important, the actual data processing. So uh, this is the part which actually runs the queries and basically extracts the 
features I want out of my data. Um, I also need like some some kind of actors acting above, uh, up on this results I get out of the data processing. So whenever I do data processing, I write the results somewhere. Usually I want some kind of app, as for example, when we had this uh, app store example before, that would kind of be like some app stores and presenting the best recommendations to you. But it's basically like some application which utilizes the output of the data processing, some actor. And to connect all of those components and to especially connect like centers to the data processing uh, component we often have within those systems, it's a message queue. So it's basically like you can imagine this as a buffer in between the producers, which are uh, the sensors, and the consumers, which is like either storage or the data processing pipeline. Um, and this is like especially important in cases of failover. You mentioned like my data or part of my data processing pipeline is failing. I can have lower throughput. I need something in between to basically buffer the input. And once uh, it has recovered, I can actually uh, retrieve all the other data from this message queue. And um, message queue, uh, there are actually a bunch of different message queues, probably like the most frequently used one is Kafka. Um, and I personally, I would classify the field of uh, message queues into two areas. So first of all, they're like the typical message brokers, which basically uh, is like a browser for, for your messages, uh, where you can have, you have your input, you can define, for example, in Kafka, it's called topics, uh, and then decide which about those topics, basically to which outputs to which things. So you could decide that certain topics should go to your Spark cluster, other uh, messages that should just be stored onto persistent storage because you, right now you don't care about them. And this is basically what a typical message broker would do to yeah, route those messages and do simple filtering on them, but no like complex aggregation. Uh, then like for especially the field of blogging, there are like some log center queues, like new log stash, which actually take a lot of logging output and help you to do something similar. So principle-wise, it's still like a queue, like a buffer in between, but it helps you to do like log-specific operations, like already filtering or extraction, uh, extracting features out of them. Um, here, I just like as one example, I said Kafka is the most frequently used one. Uh, I just depicted Kafka, and here we can nicely see like this idea of uh, decoupling the producers from the consumers of the data. So we basically we have like several partitions, and the nice thing is that first of all that helps me to scale. So I can simply add more producers as long as I also add more partitions of data uh, or partition queues, so uh, message brokers in Kafka. So I can easily scale Kafka up to handle more message workload and. Then on the other side, I can also have an uh, arbitrary number of consumers to which I basically route those messages. And while the messages are in the system, uh, they're basically buffered here within those partitions when choosing one of them versus that there are like many. And what most of us want if we're talking about the system, uh, we would actually expect that each message I put in on this side, so each of those messages is to, uh, delivered exactly once to one of those consumers. But actually in distributed systems, this is really, really hard. Because at each step in this pipeline, we might have failures. So it's kind of really difficult to define that it's exactly once delivered. So what most of the message queues will actually deliver in reality is either at most once, which means it's either delivered or it's not delivered, but you don't have it like that it's going to end up in the consumer like twice, for example. Uh, and the other model is at least once, which for example Kafka is an example for, where it ensures that each message gets at least once delivered to the consumer, but it might also be delivered several times. So uh, depending on like the failures happening in the system, it might be that the same message ends up twice at your uh, consumer end of the uh, pipeline. And this is something you just need to consider when 
writing your applications or designing your system around it, what kind of uh, delivery guarantee you have on your message queue. Because, for example, you might have to deal with duplicate values in the case of uh, at least uh, once. It might be delivered twice, it might be delivered even three times uh, to the end. And maybe just like one word, why exactly once? You're going to read that when you read the descriptions of many of those systems. You're going to see that they tell you, yeah, we have exactly one guarantee. But what's actually happening, uh, you should read like the fine print underneath, because it's usually saying, basically, we have exactly one guarantee in cases where there are no failures. If there are no failures, it's kind of okay, like not too complex to uh, reach exactly one guarantee. But as soon as you introduce failures, it's at least really, really hard to impossible to ensure this exactly once guarantee. So whenever you read that one of those systems is guaranteeing that to you, just try to read on in which cases it's actually guaranteeing that to you. All right, let's move on to the next component. And this is the stream processing. And stream processing, this is like a current hype topic and a new buzzword. So actually within like the last uh, six months, there's been like a number of new systems being pushed out or being uh, marketed. And so there are like a, really a large number of options right now you can choose from. There's like Spark Streaming, for example, which a lot of people use. Uh, there's Flink, uh, another Apache top level project. There's Storm and actually the C++ rewrite of it uh, called Heron. There's Apache Apex, Apache Zombo. So you actually you have a large field to choose from. The general idea of the stream processing is that you have a stream of data and you want to have like some queries on it. So you want, for example, the aggregate over the last two minutes uh, of a specific type of event. So for example, like in the engine case, you want to collect engine failures over like the last hours, for example. And if that's greater than five, you want to actually throw an error and inform the pilot, uh, just as an example. And as there are so many options, there are actually also a number of uh, guidelines uh, how to choose which of the systems uh, might be best suitable for you. First, and most important in my opinion, is like the, maybe not most important, but quite important, is the execution model. So the two big fields, they are called uh, native streaming and micro batches. So micro batches. This is basically what Apache uh, Spark Streaming is doing. Sorry, what Apache Spark is doing with uh, streaming, uh, and this means they basically they don't do like a continuous query, but they actually take like really small batches of data and internally do actually batch processing of that. But as batches are just really small, usually people don't see it. So it's in like the uh, milliseconds multiple milliseconds of uh, batching time. If you actually need even higher uh, or lower latency guarantees, then you should look into native streaming where you don't have batches. They really take each record at a time and process it and update their model. Whereas in the micro batching, they take like 10 records, for example, at a time and then update the model. Um, and so this is like from a perspective in my opinion, most often micro batching is sufficient for most models. Like often, like architects are saying, yeah, we really need real time, but it's really good to ask, like, to which levels of uh, response time you actually need to get. And often, micro batching is uh, sufficient in those cases. The second uh, model or second criteria I would look at is like the fault tolerance granularity. So basically, at which granularity are checkpoints taken? And if something fails, at which point can they basically rerun or restart their workload? So there are systems uh, which either do that per record, so they actually take per record uh, also a checkpoint, and so they don't have to reprocess a record uh, in case of failures. And there are systems which actually do it like per batch. And also like on this per batch model, there are different granularities again, like there are systems uh, which take like rather coarse grain batches of data <coughs> for each checkpoint and there are systems which take like really fine grained uh, batches like 10 records at a time. Again, this is like a trade-off, like uh, 
as you, more often you take a checkpoint, of course it's costing you performance and throughput. Uh, but on the other hand, in cases of failures, you can restart more quickly. Uh, if you're taking really coarse grains, uh, if you're taking really fine grained uh, checkpoints, you don't have a high restart cost, but on the other hand, you have a high cost and lower throughput as you always take those checkpoints. Um, then, similar as with uh, the message queues, delivery guarantees also streaming systems are also uh, different between different models and it's worth looking at it, uh, what, what you really need. It might be that certain streaming systems are actually not guaranteeing you that each tuple, each record gets processed, but they might drop records in cases of uh, failovers. So you need to decide whether that's okay for you or whether you really need to consider each individual record uh, and you can't miss a single one. Then, something which is also, if you look at the GitHub repos of all those projects, which is varying quite a lot, is the uh, community activity. So some of them are really active and actually gaining uh, activity if you would plot the graph. Others are really like more on a decline and I would usually go for one which is still like supported in a while, because I believe the market is quite big and I don't think all of them are going to survive the next two years. So I would have a look at like which direction is the community going when deciding for one of them. And of course, uh, for us, most important is the Mesos support. Um, uh, many of them actually support Mesos as a native scheduler, uh, cluster scheduler, and actually many of them are currently working on either improving or adding Mesos support uh, to, to that system. And most notably maybe Flink is going to have in the next release uh, native Mesos support. They already have like a very basic one undocumented in the current version which is out. But from the 1.2 version they're going to have like really nice support for using uh, Mesos as a scheduler uh, for Flink. And also the Apex people, actually Apex, they are also just starting to work on Mesos integration. Uh, so it seems to be really a topic for them and also what we hear from customers, they're also like asking our users uh, whether it's possible to run such workloads on Mesos itself, natively. As example for a streaming system, uh, I just picked uh, Spark Streaming because that's what, uh, from what I see, is still most frequently used. And I, in my opinion, the big advantage of Spark Streaming is that it nicely integrates in this entire ecosystem of Spark. So if you're already running your Spark jobs, you can actually reuse the same Spark jobs and just run them in like a streaming fashion on your data. And uh, so you don't have to rewrite your jobs from scratch. You can just take them and throw them on like the streaming part of your platform. And uh, as mentioned before, Spark uh, Streaming is using those micro batches. So what we see here is actually they're taking really small chunks of the input data and then run those queries over those small batches. And this is also why you can basically reuse the same queries because under the hood it's still uh, batch processing and nothing changes uh, in the end. All right, uh, the storage part of the picture. So storage part is even like larger uh, than the streaming uh, data processing part. Uh, because there's been like really a large number of projects, so I just try to classify them a little bit into different areas. First, it really differs uh, what kind of system you want depending on your use case. So, for example, like time series databases, they're really great if you want to store like IoT data, like uh, sensor data, because usually you have like uh, time. For each point in time, you basically you have like the same record structure, and so it nicely fits and it's nicely compressed in one of those time series databases. For other use cases, maybe like those NoSQL databases, like for example document databases or graph databases, might be a better fit for your model. And if you're in like a traditional world, also like maybe SQL systems are the right tool for you because you have an existing pipeline, you have existing queries, and you want to keep uh, support for like the SQL interface. If you're just collecting large chunks of data uh, and you just want to write it to a file, also like 
file systems are uh, quite interesting uh, to use for you. Um, here, I actually picked as an example uh, Cassandra. So Cassandra, it's, uh, I would call it a, a, a column-oriented key value store, so not necessarily database, but it's basically, uh, it's a key, it's a key value store which allows you to have several columns of data. Internally, it's uh, replicated, so it can actually nicely survive failovers. And it's uh, quite, there are some large uh, companies using that in relatively large production settings. So this is like the nice part that it's basically validated and checked uh, in production proven in large running systems. All right, and all together, it's actually there's a common combination and it's called Smack Stack. I'm just going to pop it up here. And so this is actually what a number of uh, people are running on top of Mesos or on top of ECS. And this is uh, like a nice and proven combination for doing especially those IoT-like workloads. So uh, Smack comes from a Spark, uh, which we just talked about. The M, of course, stands for Mesos, as uh, we hear at MesosCon. Uh, a is Akka, so Akka would kind of, it's an actor-based framework to write applications, uh, which is really nicely fits to distributed environments. Uh, for storage, we have Cassandra in there, and as a message queue, we would use uh, Kafka. And uh, one example how that could, whoa, that jumped a lot. All right, so um, this Mac stack is actually, as mentioned, it's used by multiple people, but there's still like, even though it's easy to deploy that on top of uh, Mesos, there's still like challenges. So in general, distributed computing is hard. So even though it might be easy to install those systems, you still have to keep on monitoring and uh, be aware that it might be difficult to debug in such kind of system. Uh, elasticity. Usually, you need to be able to scale up and scale down individual components. So if you have set up this big stack, what you usually you it doesn't they don't scale all with the same factors. So for example, you don't need to increase the uh, storage by the same factors. You would need to increase uh, your data processing layer if uh, the input uh, increases. So imagine you now have a double number of users. Usually, each of those components in the stack it's going to have a different factor uh, for uh, scaling. And yeah, of course, also a really difficult topic in general is like how to figure out what some, when something is wrong in your cluster. And that's actually, as you have a lot of components and they're basically chained, it might be kind of difficult to figure out at which point in this chain now uh, is an error occurred or what's actually wrong. <coughs> and uh, so, uh, as mentioned, is a lot of people start out by deploying that on their clusters. And this is kind of like this typical motivation to use Mesos, right? Initially, in a pre-Mesos data center, you would actually you would pick like certain uh, sub-clusters. You would basically partition your big clusters into one for doing data analytics with Spark or Hadoop. You would choose one for Kafka, like three or four nodes. You would choose two nodes for MySQL. Uh, five nodes for your microservice and another number of instances for running your storage, for example, with Cassandra. And so as you always have to pick like the maximum number of nodes which you might uh, encounter, so to serve like the maximum workload which could ever occur, uh, you're usually, usually wasting like a lot of resources and having like a relatively low resource utilization. And so this is actually this has meant the prime, I, or one of the prime use cases for Mesos, when, which allows you to actually consolidate all those different workloads on fewer machines, as you can basically co-locate it, and you don't have the static partitioning uh, across your cluster. All right, uh, just one slide on ECS about that. So ECS is basically like, uh, enables you really nicely to do it, especially because you have like this universe store from which you can easily install all those different applications. Uh, and so this entire like smack stack, you can easily set up by just ECS package installs, individual packages.
pictures and you just need to write like your Akka application and you have this uh, smack stack basically running on DCS uh, rather quickly. Still, even though it's like really quick to set up, uh, what you should keep in mind is also like how do I operate that? So this is what we usually refer to as like day two operations. So how do you do updates? So how do you first update like for example your Cassandra service? How do you update your underlying DCOS service? This is all like the operational points you should keep in mind uh, even before designing an architecture in such system. And uh, also like how do you do general maintenance? So even though it's uh, like inbuilt fault tolerant, you should have backups uh, to be able to restore if there are like any critical failures and uh, you need to restart your cluster. Uh, you should monitor uh, progresses and basically monitor metrics to figure out when something is really going on, uh, wrong in your cluster. Is there too many tasks failing? Is there tasks restarting over and over again? If your Mesos uh, master is flapping and restarting and restarting, so uh, this is those are all like important points you should keep in mind when actually operating your cluster. And those points are going to make it easier also as you understand your cluster to debug potential runtime problems of your cluster. Uh, we actually we had a talk just two hours ago about the ECS SDK. So. If you want to run exactly the smack stack we were talking about, it's all there in the universe, but you might actually want to decide to write your own framework or integrate your own framework, as for example, currents with the Flink people or the Apache Apex people are doing. And there is actually like an experimental uh, SDK which can help you to develop those new stateful services uh, where you actually want to store data and uh, yeah, write data. So it's rather simple to write like a new framework doing data analytics or integrating one of those new frameworks. And all this smack stack is actually it's running in production at rather large scale. So for example, Uber is using Apache Cassandra on Mesos, uh, Bing is using <coughs> Kafka on DCS, Verizon is also using uh, Cassandra and Kafka. So uh, this is also like a nice validation that it's running safely and at scale uh, on, on top of Mesos or on top of TCOS. All right. And this actually brings me to the demo uh, I briefly wanted to show. And it's actually, it's the S3 demo, which was mentioned this morning even uh, by, or no, yesterday by Aaron. Uh, so it's actually like uh, S3. They're like a big geospatial, geo data processing company. And uh, what we have here, what we'll see, uh, is we're gonna see like how taxis are being tracked driving throughout New York City, and the different use cases we can use for that. The architecture, just so we know it up front before seeing the demo, is actually like underneath, we have like a storage layer, we're using Elasticsearch, so it's not exactly the smack stack, we're replacing the C by an E for Elasticsearch, uh, but the rest is actually uh, pretty much the same as in the smack stack. So we're using uh, Spark for data processing, um, and uh, then uh, we actually ha have an input of all those uh, taxis driving around within uh, yeah, New York City or simulated New York City in uh, the demo. Um, and the flow actually is going to be uh, the, we're going to have event sources here, which we're also going to deploy on our cluster. And then we're going to use Kafka as a message queue in between. So it's first all going to go to, from Kafka. And from there, actually, the analytics uh, Spark streaming jobs are going to pick it up and uh, then push the output into Elasticsearch from where it's actually picked up and displayed on our map. So uh, the map we're going to see in a second, uh, it's actually it's going to be uh, served by the Elasticsearch uh, uh, storage. I actually wanted to give the demo uh, here, but it kind of, was kind of hard uh, to set up here. Just it's not a connection for your laptop. So I actually would just show a video and narrate throughout the video. If not yet. Thank you. So uh, we 
start by just seeing basically uh, our cluster uh, with 11 nodes. So uh, we actually, this is a rather large cluster for a demo, but we actually, uh, the demo data set is quite large. So uh, we consciously picked like a large cluster to run that demo uh, and fitted the data set to that. Here, we see this universe we talked about before, which actually enables you to install this Mac stack just by clicking install package here. And they're actually also like, what we saw on top, those are like official packages, which have, which have been certified uh, and well tested. And they're actually like all those community packages. So this is also what I like about the universe, that anyone can actually put a package there and uh, also bring out a new Action and enable a lot of people to use it. Uh, here we actually see then the Elasticsearch uh, UI. And so when running Elasticsearch here, what's actually quite cool, what we just saw, we can easily scale up and scale down our service. So uh, we just, there by clicking, we just increased like the number of servers we wanted for our Elasticsearch. So uh, here we actually we're checking that Kafka is running. So I can actually control Kafka via the ECUS CLI. So I don't have to go like SSH to node and then do Kafka specific uh, configuration. I can actually do all of that from the ECUS CLI. And we just check that all the brokers are basically running. Uh, Marathon, which is used as the init system for the cluster. And so it's actually running all the services we just installed. Um, and we're seeing all of them are basically healthy and running. Clear? And now we actually start uh, deploying their so-called RAT. So the RAT stands for Real-Time Analytic Task, and this is basically uh, the Spark streaming job. So we're deploying uh, two different RATs and uh, one data source, which we see here. So data source is basically like the simulated data of uh, taxis driving around in New York City. And we can check here, yeah, they're all running, and they're actually all running on different uh, hosts. And if, if we check what those REDS tasks actually are, they're just using like normal Spark streaming, they're using the Mesosphere Spark uh, Docker image, and do like a simple Spark submit to run their, uh, to run the job. So nothing special, nothing fancy. And this is the source, so this is, as I said, this is going to simulate the taxis driving around in New York City. And again, this is just like a Docker image uh, creating uh, those data and pushing it into uh, Kafka. And actually, as Mesos is powering all of this, so DCS is still like built up on top of uh, Mesos, we can actually check even in Mesos itself uh, which tasks are currently running uh, within the cluster. All right, and here, this is now the actual JavaScript application uh, displaying all this data. And what we see here, this is basically like an aggregated view of how many taxis there are within this region I select. And uh, right now we're zooming in. And we can see the further we zoom in, the fi more fine granular the view gets. And we see that like in each of those uh, uh, rectangles, how many taxis there are currently. And if we want, we can even switch this to like a more hexagon view uh, and also see the aggregate view. If we really zoom in to uh, further, we're going to see individual taxis uh, as individual data parts. So those are basically like the simulated real-time taxis driving around in New York City. Uh, now we actually, we're gonna take a look at uh, JFK Airport and see what's going on there, how many taxis there are. And what we can actually do, we can identify individual taxis. So here, we're checking out this taxi, it has how many passengers? Uh, one, and uh, we can also see like the taxi ID so we can actually identify and drill back uh, on individual data points here. The other part that we can do, as this is like uh, 
geotemporal uh, as well, we can actually replay time, so we can go back in time and view uh, how something happened over a specific time frame. And while doing that, we can actually even get queries on it. So right now we saw this one taxi before with like ID, I think 180, and we can basically just say, I want to track this taxi, what it did over the last hour uh, at JFK. If we zoom back out, and I think now we're zooming to Central Park. Slowly but slowly. We can actually uh, do a more IoT-like use case. So what we'll do here, we have a simulated person. And this area you're seeing <coughs> is actually the one minute radius from which it can be reached uh, by a taxi. So this is like factoring in current traffic situation uh, and like road situation. And you just added another data source which is going to deploy a taxi driving around. So this taxi, it's going to drive around and as soon as it hits this uh, area, uh, we can actually inform that person. And yeah, he's happy now because the taxi is like almost there and it's going to reach him. So uh, this is kind of like an example. You saw how easy it was to that as like the standard components are already there. So I basically I just have to uh, connect them and then have my in data input, which in this case it was simulated, uh, and I can easily analyze and for example get like this one minute radius uh, from where someone can be reached uh, or picked up by a taxi. basically over time, uh, so again, this is like the temporal aspect, we can see the hotspots like where taxis used to be, and this could, for example, be used to identify if you're matching uh, people being there and taxis being there, where like hotspots, if I'm like operating my taxi service, where should I deploy more taxis at which time of day, because uh, there's like more demand or too few taxis actually. All right, yeah, that was the demo video. I said I wish I could have given it live, but it's kind of difficult with this setup here. All right, and that actually uh, already brings us to an end of this demo. I actually, I can just urge you to, you can actually run that yourself. I have the uh, GitHub links to the demo repo in here. Uh, so uh, go there and actually try it out, uh, and just, then just build your own application processing fast <coughs> data. And yes, yeah, I would actually open up the room for questions. No questions? All right, then thank you very much.